I'm Dr. Chip Levy, and I'm Professor of Medicine and Medical Director of Cardiac Rehabilitation and Preventive Cardiology and Director of the Exercise Laboratories here at the John Oshner Heart and Vascular Institute, Oshner Clinical School, the, the University of Queensland School of Medicine here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm here today to discuss our state-of-the-art manuscript, which is titled, The Effects of Running on Chronic Diseases and Cardiovascular and All-Cause Mortality, which will be published online in the September and in a subsequent issue, the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. I'm really excited about this paper because it combines my interest and love for running specifically and exercise in general and my interest in preventive medicine and preventive cardiology. But also, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to publish this paper with seven close friends and big-name co-authors from around the United States, including Dr. Stephen Blair, who's often considered the father of aerobic fitness and the lead author of the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study, with Dr. D.C. Lee, who last year published perhaps the most influential running paper in the world, and Dr. James O'Keefe, who's published a lot in recent years on raising the idea of potential cardiotoxicity with extreme endurance exercise, as well as four other big-name co-authors. Now, in our paper, we review a lot of exercise and running studies, but the majority of the data comes from four large data banks, the National Runners and Walkers Study with Dr. Paul Williams, and we, we cited 18 of his studies, uh, the National Running Aging Study, the Copenhagen City Heart Study with Dr. Peter Schnorr, and the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study that Dr. D.C. Lee published with Dr. Blair and I, and two other co-authors on this paper, Dr. Timothy Church and May Shui. Now, the data we reviewed clearly showed that running is associated with lower weight and less prevalence of obesity. That's not a big surprise. We also showed that the runners have a lower prevalence of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and type 2 diabetes. Again, that's not a big surprise considering the effects that running has on weight and insulin sensitivity. But paradoxical, or contrary to popular belief, we also showed that the runners have lower osteoarthritis and less need for hip replacements. Now, there may be selection bias, but still, it certainly doesn't suggest that running is increasing the risk of arthritis. We also demonstrate that the runners have lower benign prosthetic hypertrophy and less disability with aging. The runners also have lower respiratory disease mortality, less cancers from several causes, and lower risk of stroke. But probably the most impressive data with running is its effects on reducing cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. And all four of the major studies that we reviewed have data in this regard. But probably the best data comes from the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study that D.C. Lee was first author on, published last year in JAK. It's a study of 55,000 people, 13,000 runners and 42,000 non-runners, who were followed on average for 15 years. And this study showed reductions in mortality and cardiovascular mortality of 30 and 45 percent respectively in the runners. An average life extension of three years and 4.1 year extension in cardiovascular life. We showed that the persistent runners had the best effect and those who started running but stopped or who weren't running but started had about half the benefit compared to the persistent non-runners. Again, no major surprise. I think many people would expect that runners are healthier, and running is also promoting health, so probably would be associated with better survival. But what is surprising is the data on dosing. We divided the 13,000 runners into quintiles based on miles run per week, times run per week, minutes per week, and we showed that quintile one, which was less than six miles per week, only running one to two times per week and less than 52 minutes per week of running, well less than the federal activity guidelines for exercise, had the maximal benefits on mortality and cardiovascular mortality, 
equal effects as quintiles two, three, and four, and a trend toward even better effects than quintile five. Certainly suggesting that regarding dosing, more is not better with regard to protection against cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. And the data from the Copenhagen City Heart Study, um, which is in a smaller cohort, showed basically the same maximum benefits at low doses of running. Now certainly we know though that many athletes have to run more than this if they're competing in marathons and triathlons. And we discussed the potential adverse cardiotoxicity of this excessive running. We're not trying to scare the athletes, but it's worth, we think, that the athletes and their clinicians know about the potential risk. And just for example, if you study people after a marathon, about a third of them release troponin, a third release BNP, brain natriuretic peptide. The same thing is released in heart attack and heart failure. If we do scans of their heart like echoes, we see that about a third get dilatation and cardiac dysfunction, particularly of the right side of the heart and the ventricular septum. And we know if you follow people, heavy exercises have more coronary artery calcification. They certainly get more atrial fibrillation. The very serious risks are probably small, but it's worth the athletes knowing that there are some risks and the clinicians knowing the same. And clearly, if one is exercising at a high level, it's not for health because the maximum health benefits occur at very low doses. The reason for doing extreme levels of exercise is non-health reasons like competition, fun, camaraderie, etc. So in conclusion, there's tremendous data about the benefits of running is a very effective and efficient form of exercise, particularly protection against chronic diseases and cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. And for the vast majority of people, the benefits of running are going to well outweigh the risk. Thank you very much. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.